Thank God he's still with us, and he's in the studio to talk about that and other things right now. Morning. Good, good morning, old mate. Good Jeez. to see you, mate. <laughs> I tell you what, it's good to see you for sure and certain. Yes. Um, you're 48. Yep. Um, you were very, very fit as a wiggle. Um, are you still as fit now you're not performing as regularly as you used to? Well, look, funnily enough, I think I'm fitter than I was back then. Really? Towards the end of my time with the wiggles, I, I did carry a bit of weight. Um I did struggle with the weight a bit back then, mm. uh, but certainly now I felt I was much fitter than I ever was. Have you had stress tests and other things done in the past in concert with the earlier illness you had? With the earlier stuff I did have, and they were blown away by how fit I was back then, right. and they said you've got a, a good, strong heart. And so with all the exercise I've been doing recently, playing cricket every weekend, I felt really good, mm. no warning signs, no symptoms. So when the show was coming up, I thought, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to just walk a little bit harder this morning, go a little mm. bit faster, see if I can push myself, knowing that the show was coming up, because they are tough shows, yeah. these shows. Um, but I don't remember the show now, unfortunately. I, I don't know what happened. Obviously, I had a cardiac arrest. But, mm. um, yeah, I, I thought I was fit. And I guess that's part of this message is no matter how fit and strong you might think you are, you may still be susceptible. So mm. make sure you have the checks done. So would the doctors say to you now, if you'd come to them in June of last year and done the normal checks and an angiogram even perhaps or a stress test, they could have diagnosed that you were battling a blockage of some description? Yeah, look, most most likely if I had got to that point, but I did go to the doctor about six weeks before the concert and had my bloods done for mm. cholesterol. And the cholesterol was a little high, but not enough for them to be concerned about. So mm. that didn't sort of trigger anything. So I went happily on my way and wiggled my butt off that night and nearly didn't make it. So at what stage during that day or that night performing did you start to feel a bit crook? I don't know because I don't remember anything. Not at all? No. I, yeah. I guess that's, they call it trauma amnesia. So yeah. when you have this kind of event, uh, I don't know. But, um, yeah, look, the, yeah, I only remember a couple of things about the show. Maybe and and memories. did witnesses say you collapsed backstage or off stage? Where yeah. were you at the time? I, I think from, from what I understand, yeah. I, as we were leaving the stage yeah. uh, before the encore song, I can vaguely remember reaching down to get my drink that was at the side of the sure. stage, and I remember the floor kind of feeling like it was getting closer, but that's mm. about all I can remember. So you've suffered a cardiac arrest, and this is where we get to the point now. So th there are a number of matters. Yeah. If Greg Page, at 47, relatively fit for a man his age, already having undergone various health checks, including blood tests and the like, can have a heart attack, well, by crikey, anyone can. Yeah. So that's the first message, and, and what I talk on the program, and I know you, you, you are a man that listens to the program because I hear from you regularly about a whole range of issues, yeah. that men's health, and particularly those listening to us in rural areas now, they don't go and get the normal health check, heart health, cancer check, melanoma check, skin check, yeah. um, you know, the prostate check, all those things that they should do, they don't do it. So it's as much a warning about general health as it is about heart health today. Absolutely. But then, poor old Murray, my late dad, he hits the deck at a club at Nelson Bay with a schooner in his hand with his father and his brother. He was the youngest of four boys. At 46, he's pronounced dead when he arrives at hospital. Um, and I've never inquired as to whether a defibrillator or resuscitation techniques, which weren't really discussed, let alone heart health back in 1975, would have saved my dad. But... You and I exchanged text messages and I revealed that to you and hadn't spoken to you about it before, about my own situation. And I, since I lost another great mate, Peter Falingos, in 2004, again at the age of 59 to a heart attack, on the phone to David Gallup and dropped dead in the News Corp offices without any indication he'd been crook at all. But you're here because of the actions, I'm told, of your colleagues from the Wiggle Touring Company and, God bless, a registered nurse. Yep. And there was a doctor there as well, actually, who, who jumped up. Yeah, without those people, I would not be here. There's no doubt. You know, it, it just goes without saying that those people saved my life that night mm. uh, because they knew CPR. And when the defibrillator got on the scene, they were willing to use it. Now, the club had one. Do we know how far it was from the actual function area where you were? In the, no, in, I in don't the... know. No. So, uh, and so I'm thinking out aloud about all these things. So just say you and I go to our local shopping centre, Westfield at, at, uh, at Castle Towers, I should say, Castle Towers or Westfield, Parramatta or yep. any of the shopping centres where people attend. I mean, and you, you fall base over apex. 
does someone in the shopping centre know exactly where to go to get the defibrillator? Because there's not one in every corner. I mean, so I, I'm thinking, do we need to make it more aware, the defibrillator yep, on level two yep. or level three or one on each level? There needs to be, um, number one, availability of mm. the, the product, of the, the defibs. Number two, awareness of where they're located. Mm. Number three, um, you know, knowing how to use them when, when it's required. But there needs to be some sort of... Um, almost like uniform signage for these things because there's no uniformity about it. It's mm. almost like you need to have the universal, you know, the stop sign. Everybody knows a stop sign. Yeah. You need a, a sign that you know where the AED is when it's needed. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've got two in this building here and we know exactly yeah, where they are right. and there are wardens and how to operate them yeah. and things like that. But this is an operation with 120, 140 people. But in major shopping centres, you wouldn't know where to look. And no. one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, apart from thanking God you're still here... Uh, a couple of years ago, May 2017, I got involved with a thing called the Brent Kelly Foundation. Now, Brent was up at a place you know well, Fagan Park. Uh, he was running with his 11-year-old daughter at Fagan Park at Galston. He had a heart attack and died. Now, there was no defibrillator there. Uh, there were nurses there that tried to perform CPR, but unsuccessfully. Paramedics told his wife, Lisa, had there been a defibrillator, at the park, he may well have lived. That's not the fault of the park or anyone else. It's just a fact of life. Yeah. So we got together with Lisa and we petitioned the government to somehow, on a small scale, get defibrillators at sporting clubs and venues like Fagan Park where people walk and exercise. So in June of 2017, Lisa was on the program. The then Sports Minister of New South Wales, Stuart Ayres, announced the allocation of $4 million over four years to assist sporting clubs across New South Wales purchase and maintain the AEDs, the Automatic External Defibrillators. So that was a small thing we did then in honour of of Brent Kelly and through the Brent Kelly Foundation. And he lives on through that foundation and lives on that there are defibrillators in places that never had them before because the government went 50-50 with the sporting clubs and said, here it is. But I think now, with a voice like yours, we need to really talk to the whole of Australia about a re-education program about CPR and defibrillators. De- definitely, absolutely. Businesses everywhere. I mean, if you've got a fire extinguisher and you've got smoke alarms in your business, you should have a defib because, you know, those smoke detectors and fire extinguishers are there to save lives mm. in case of a fire. And we hope we never need those, just like we would hope we never need a defib. But should we ever need it? And it does happen. I mean, cardiac arrest leads to so many deaths in Australia, mm. only one in 10 survive. And I'm one of those lucky one in 10. 10%. Not, 10% survive an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Mm. 70% of cardiac arrests happen at home. And so a lot of the time, it's family members that are going to need to know CPR to save their loved ones. Mm. So it's a really powerful message that everybody should learn CPR, know how to do it, and, and bring back the person that they love, just like I was brought back by these amazing people. When you arrived at hospital, um, when did it suddenly dawn upon you after surgery that you had dodged a bullet, a rather large bullet? Uh, look, I can remember being in hospital. I'm not sure when it was, whether it was before or after, but my wife Vanessa was there, and she's actually a cardiac nurse, not at Westmead, but at uh, another hospital. Mm. And, um, you know, apparently I was very disoriented, and I just kept saying, where am I? What happened? Mm. I, I can remember her saying, you're having a massive heart attack. <laughs> It was like, what? Yeah. I, I, I didn't pick myself for being likely for a heart No, attack. you're the last candidate. Of, you know, I know hundreds of blokes. <laughs> you know, if I knew 300 blokes, you're 299 for having a heart attack. I would have thought so, but that's the other message, isn't it? As we said, you know, just mm. get yourself checked out. So that's, that was the first sort of knowledge of it. And then after that, it was just, you know, waking up in the hospital ward mm. after the operation and... Um, yeah, it really just hit me that mm. hearing the stories of the people that were there that night. I mean, the Wiggles uh, really have to be comm- commended on how they handled the whole thing. Mm. Um, you know, f- from the people that stepped up and, and did the CPR, but Paul Field, uh, the manager of the Wiggles, he came down to the hospital. He didn't leave until about 3 a.m. that night. He was mm. he was very concerned, and, um, you know, he's just managed the whole thing extremely well. His son, Luke Field, got straight on the radio as soon as I collapsed, called for Kimmy Antonelli, who he knew new CPR so that she could come and attend to me. Mm. So everybody acted so quickly and that just really helped my my chances. But that figure is is startling and scary, 10%. It is. And we need to improve that. And with defibs and CPR, we can improve that. That's the main message. Okay. So once you were on the road to recovery, we started exchanging text messages and I revealed my story and you didn't know the details. And 
I said, whenever you want to come on when you're better and talk about this, let's have a yarn uh, about the great news that you're still with us, but the even bigger news that we need people to learn CPR. And um, you've decided that you're going to do a CPR course. Yep, I am. It's uh, So I... where, where do you... Look, see, I feel stupid. All yeah. my children have done the course. They've done the Surf Life Saving course, which includes CPR. They've all done it. And so we're having a conversation recently about that. And I said, Dad, have you done CPR? And I said, no, I don't know. I haven't. And they yeah. said, well, how dumb is that? You, you've you know, been part of our lives getting us to do it, and here you are, the head of the family, and you've not, not done it yourself, and I felt really silly. So I'll join with you. So where do we start? Where do we go to do a CPR course? Well, interestingly enough, I did look it up, and St John Ambulance run a CPR first aid course at Castle Hill RSL Club. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you strike, said strike me down. At, yep. at <laughs> the place did. it happened. Yes, that's right. So I'll be going there at some stage in the very near future to, mm. to do their CPR course. Okay, now what do we do? And this is Australia-wide, not just about the New South Wales government, but other governments that participate in the program, whether it be in Queensland or the ACT at the moment. What do we do about talking to governments? Now, someone just sent me an email. Not sure if you know, but Woolworths has defibs installed at most stores, if not all, at the service desk. Well, I wasn't aware of that. No, I wasn't you and either. I, we've both got a local Woolies we attend in our local yep. area. So that's good to know. But I guess what we've got to say is to businesses, you see, it's compulsory. If you go to the council and you want to get a DA to start your business, they've got to look around. Have you got a fire extinguisher? Yep. Okay, you've got those things, smoke alarms, you've got them. Yep. But no one says, have you got a defibrillator? No, that's right. And... You know, cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest will kill more people than fires. Now, probably mostly because we have the preventative measures there to stop mm. fires taking lives. Mm. We need to do the same to stop sudden cardiac arrest taking the lives of so many people. And it will come about through legislation. I'm going to get involved in, in lobbying governments about that. Mm. There's already a lot of work being done in South Australia, and they're quite close to getting it through there, I believe. Really? So if that takes off... Um, I think the other states will have to follow. And it just it, it's almost like a no-brainer. These things save lives. Get them out there. Get people knowing where they are and how to use them. And let's save as many lives as we can. Mm. Well, I'm on board with you. That's what we have to do. We, Thanks, we, we, we've got to do, and we'll lobby health ministers in both states and territory to make sure that they're aware of it. And it should be legislation that if you apply for a DA via a local council to start a business, whether you've got two employees or 102 that as well as a fire extinguisher and a smoke detector, you've got a defibrillator That's there. Right. And, and that we're not talking about a massive cost. No, they're not, they're not overly expensive for, for what they can achieve. Mm. They're, they're very cost-effective. Um, they're about... They range in price from $2,000 to 2800 something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's not as if we're talking about $20,000 no. worth of equipment. We're talking about a couple of grand. And I, I would also point out that four-year plan that Stuart Ayres put in place, it doesn't lapse until... Uh, next year, yeah. 2021. So they reimburse half of the purchase price for uh, organisations. And I think at the moment we're talking sporting clubs and maybe we can talk to the relevant ministers at the moment about extending that and going halves with organisations. So it might cost them eight or 900 or 1,000 and the government picks up the rest or something yeah, like that. But it, That's a great initiative, mate. And, yeah. and, the, and the impost on the public health system uh, oh. is another way. I mean, if, if people are saved That's right. uh, in, in some way, well, obviously, it's a shorter stay in hospital. And mm -hmm. how long were you in before you were out? Relatively oh, quickly. About four or five days, I think. Yeah. 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 So and, it's... and how are you now? Oh, mate, I'm great. Apart from the fractured ribs where they did the CPR, yeah. you know, I'm almost, I think, better than you. Mate, well, it wouldn't be hard. I, yeah. I, have got a few, I have got a few years on you, son. <laughs> yeah, I, a few, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've survived a few more than you. Yeah, maybe. But uh, it, it's particularly important in every instance uh, that, that people think about it, about their general health. And, uh, again, I don't want to make it, you know, about men, but it is about men. Women are far more far more caring about their own health than men are. So it is about men, particularly rural men, and it, it's an important issue we should discuss and keep discussing. So any time you need someone to talk to and to be uh, part of the voice, I'll be here for you, old Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Appreciate I'm, that. I'm just so delighted that things are going well for you and that uh, you're back walking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, back at the gym. Yeah, not cricket just yet, but uh, no. back at the gym and back walking. No, well, maybe you can go along and score for a while. Yeah, I have been, we, yeah. We don't want you in the outfield chasing <laughs> balls or anything Not like that. Yet, no. Okay. Greg Page, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for that uh, information, and we'll join you in making sure that this message gets out to everyone across Australia that takes in our program because it's a very important issue. And if it's not for the items we're talking about today, CPR and defibrillators, we wouldn't have Greg Page sitting here with us, which is 
a very sad and scary thought for all of us. It was, particularly for my family. So thank you for getting on board, Ray. Good on you, mate. Thanks. Greg Page in the studio with us, and uh, it's an important initiative we'll keep talking about. CPR and defibrillators and heart health.